guys, so I haven't filmed in a long time, so I'm feeling pretty rusty and kind of out of this. You'll have to forgive me if there are a million jump cuts or if I'm rambling for a really long time. Um, I'm just out of practice and hopefully it'll get better. I'm here today with my second round of March reviews. Lately I've been reading a lot of poetry because I wanted one of those binges where you go on your library website and you just, like you're really into a particular thing, so in my case poetry. And so you get like 10 different poetry collections on hold. They all come to your house and you're just sitting there looking at these 10 poetry collections. Like, I need to read 10 books of poetry right now, oh god. I went through that, and so three out of the five things I have are poetry collections. And I'm coming at this as someone who hasn't been reading poetry for fun for a very long time. So that's probably something to keep in mind, is that I'm no expert. I've, aside from like these collections, I don't know, must have read five other collections in my life and read an assortment of poems and studied only a few poems. Like, I am a complete amateur. So keep that in mind. The first collection I read was Teaching My Mother How to Give Birth by Warson Shire. This was really good for me in particular, I think, because it was easy to read and it was easy to understand most of the things that it was saying. And it was exploring very distinctive, like understandable themes, the so things like immigration and family and ties to culture, big sexuality and femininity and lots of different things. So if you're not comfortable with poetry, I think it's good to read something like this that has a point and it's trying to get across a particular point and it's not difficult to understand what that point is and what the poem was trying to get across. So I enjoyed that and that was good for me, I think. I believe she's a spoken word poet and that kind of gets across in her poetry where it's very lyrical and if you read it out loud it really enhances the reading of the poem. The writing isn't difficult to understand because it never really tends towards flourish like Anne Sexton, the, another one I've read. I feel like this poem kind of encapsulates what this collection is about. Um, this is the last poem so I'm just gonna read it really quickly. It's called In Love and in War. To my daughter I will say, when the men come, set yourself on fire. It's beautiful and it's compact and it's thrilling and exciting to unravel and it's exciting to read. So I'm really excited to read more of her work because I think it's amazing and I think that like her writing is polished now, but you know, in a few years and in a decade, like she'll be even better. And I can see that there's like such amazing potential in what she's writing and what she's trying to say. Then after that, I read Candide by Voltaire. I feel like Candide is just exactly my sense of humor where it's just, it's very wry and it's not so much laugh out loud funny, but it is the kind of thing that you look at and you just smile because it's, it's funny, like it's just funny. And this is a satire. In Voltaire's lifetime, there was this other philosopher, uh, I believe his name is Leibniz, I just don't know. He espoused the idea that this world is the best of all possible worlds. So he was trying to answer the theological question of if God is all powerful, then why does this world have suffering in it? You know, why is there still pain in this world? And how he answered that was that you know, because God is all powerful and he ha he can envision thousands of possible worlds and realities and we live in this one, he chose this one, right? So he chose this one, that means that this world must be the best of all possible worlds. So Voltaire didn't really agree. So in response to this, he wrote Candide. So in the beginning of the novel, Candide is a pupil of this teacher who essentially espouses a similar kind of philosophy to what I just told. And so he is set in his belief that, you know, this is the best of all possible worlds. And he lives in this Eden and he is very happy, so it's easy for him to believe that at first. But then, you know, he gets kicked out of the castle and he goes through a series of disasters. When I say disasters, I mean this man has suffered like no one else has suffered before, except the other people in the book, because everyone's suffering. Like, the most tragic, horrible, terrible backstory I could possibly imagine, these characters have gone through. In the face of all this, Fukani tries to uphold this philosophy and he tries to think, you know, okay, fine, I just saw like a thousand men die, but it's still the best of all possible worlds, and that that's fine, I guess that's cool. And then he sees another tragedy, and he undergoes some more failures and hardships, and, th and then you see his philosophy sort of shift and change, and in the end it's not a pessimistic text, I don't think at all. It's about how the world sucks, and how there are bad things in this world, but we can be resilient, and we are resilient, and we are able to get through those things through core human values. It's this really small text, but it's really compact. And this is not difficult to read. You don't even need to do any of the re research I did, which was just for fun in the end. But like, if you just read it as a funny satire on a happy-go-lucky guy who's like ridiculously optimistic and that's beaten down a lot, but in a funny way, is then I would definitely recommend it. The next thing I read was the poetry collection again, which was um, Transformations by Anne Sexton. And this was the first like collection of poetry I've read from Anne Sexton. I've read a few of her assorted poems before. Essentially, every poem Anne Sexton gives a prologue to a particular fairy tale, so she kind of modernizes it and takes themes from that fairy tale and applies them to things in our modern world and then for like the first half or for the first 30, 40 percent of the poem and then the rest of the poem is a retelling of the fairy tale. What's kind of interesting with this collection is she never strays from the original plot of the stories. It's she never changes anything, she doesn't modernize like the actual story itself, but what she does is she takes themes and she takes ideas and events from it and she just kind of makes them creepy or kind of just puts a little spin on them and she changes perspective on them like with 
v- like very subtly, but your perception of the tale can shift based off your reading of the poems. Obviously, I mean, Anne Sexton is a phenomenal writer. If you haven't read her before, then read her. She's quite depressing. In a particularly positive mindset at the moment, then maybe don't read her. Definitely set her aside for a time when you're much more comfortable with doom than, you know, love and happiness. Um, what I will say about this is that it's not hard to understand. It's not like reading the first page of Finnegan's Wake, so this isn't difficult. And the, the stories themselves, like the section of the poem that focuses on the story, is much easier to understand. But then the beginnings are sometimes kind of convoluted, it's kind of hard to understand what she's trying to get at, but I don't think that should really detract from your reading of it. So even if you're like a complete beginner, even if you haven't read a lot of poetry, I think that even if you don't understand the beginning, it's fine. You'll understand the story, you'll be able to get the point of it. Um, but yeah, just be aware of that. I'm really positive today. <laughs> That's nice. Will this last? And the next thing I read was The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. I haven't read Tolkien since I was, I don't know, late elementary school, early middle school. Like, I was young, and at the time I didn't really like it because, I don't know, my, my father forced me to read it because he said it would be great and you'll love it, and so I read it, but I'm like, ugh, you made me read this, I don't like it. Um, and so for a while I just kind of lived with the perception that, like, Lord of the Rings is fine and Tolkien's fine, whatever, it's not for me. But then I read The Hobbit, and oh my god, like, Tolkien is amazing. His writing is good, and the plot is good, and the characters are good, and it's interesting, and it's fun, and it's not boring at all. This is a really, really fun, interesting book. Like, I absolutely love it. Follows Bilbo Baggins, who is a hobbit who doesn't really like adventures, and he's just a happy-go-lucky hobbit living in his hole, you know, drinking his tea and having a good life. Um, and along comes Gandalf and a, basically this gang of dwarves, and they take him on this adventure. And in this, on this adventure, we see Bilbo change, we see his interac- interactions with the dwarves, we see the world that they're experiencing, we see the different people, um, the landscape that they're going through, and this is just good fantasy. I definitely want to get to reading Lord of the Rings again because I did not remember loving The Hobbit like this, and if I love The Hobbit, I'll probably love Lord of the Rings, so I'm really, really excited for that. Yeah, give it a try if you haven't. And then the last thing I read, which finally I don't like something, yay, um, was Ruby, uh, Milk and Honey by Ruby Kapoor, Kapoor, I don't remember, I don't have it with me. This is essentially a collection of very, very short poems. So like I'm talking maybe five to ten lines on average with like little like line drawings that the author has done just to kind of illustrate some of her points. And this is all pieced together in a collection that looks very chunky, but I mean, it's very quick to get through. And in there she talks about dealing with sexual assault and being a woman and um, recovery and healing and like lots of different things and themes that are very personal to her. It's difficult to write something like this because I think that this collection was a bunch of poems written by a woman who was trying to heal. Because she wrote those poems to heal herself, she wrote those poems as reflections and as manifestations of the emotions that she was feeling. And I think that's it. Like, that's their self. It's kind of like when you've had a bad day and you write about it in your diary. And you, who has had this bad day, if you go back to the diary later, a year from now, two years from now, you might be able to empathize with that bad day because you understand exactly what the diary is trying to say, and so you're able to really feel it for it and really feel the things that the diary wants to conjure. And I think in that sense, that's kind of what this book is like, because it's not that I didn't empathize with some or even a lot of these poems, it's not that I didn't feel things as I read them, but I think that these poems will not evoke anything from you other than emotion, and that only if you've undergone the event or the experience or the emotion that the poem is trying to describe. It never invokes anything new in you. It'll only bring back past feelings because it's almost as if, it's almost like reading your own diary. It's almost like reading a diary of an emotion where and she'll have a poem that's about, for example, for me, um, she has a poem about body image, right? And I, it's like a five line poem. I can read it and I might feel something because yes, I have felt exactly what that girl has felt. But someone who hasn't had any images is just body image. will just read those five lines and think, okay. it's quotable, but the quotes will only resonate with those who have felt. And that's not a bad thing, because this collection has clearly resonated with a lot of people. It's clearly very popular, and that's for a reason, because people love it and people relate to it. But I think its value is in invoking old emotions, and its value is in people who have experienced those things reading it. What I'm trying to get at, I think, is that, you know, a 35-year-old bearded man isn't going to read this collection and feel something. And I might be wrong, maybe you do, but I just think that the power there is no power in the words, so much as the power in the emotion that the words are trying to describe, which I think is different than actual good writing. So I've rambled a lot, and I'm going to try to leave some of the ramble in, so if there was a point that I was circling this whole time, hopefully you'll get it. So it wasn't my favorite. I do think that if you read a few of the poems and they do evoke emotion in you, and if you do really like them, then definitely check it out. Then it's something that has something for you and that you can really get something from. If you read a few poems and you're left cold, then I think it's only because 
there is nothing for you in this collection. So yeah, um, let me know if you've read any of these, let me know if you agree with what I've said, if you disagree, if you hate any of the books I've loved, if you love Milk and Honey, if so, why? Maybe it's not for the reason I've said, maybe you have never experienced any of these things, maybe you just loved it because you think it was an amazing, it was amazing writing, um, and if so, please tell me. Thanks again for watching and have a good day.